All right. So yes. So with the transition with uh, Sally stock, um, because we're going to dive in the bone marrow, but you know it's connected to the brain. Actually, the brain can, uh, regulates uh, many things. And an example uh, is indeed, as mentioned by John, the the uh, 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 circadian uh, control uh, of uh, bone marrow uh, stem cell egress. Um, is you know begins with uh, light actually and the RPE cells may be facilitating facilitating this and with uh, signals uh, processed in the suprachiasmatic nucleus transmitted uh, down to the bone marrow stromal cells and signaling by adrenergic uh, uh, or catecholamines uh, uh, via the beta three. Uh, uh, adrenergic receptor, and I'll come back to this uh, later in the talk, that regulates a CXCL12 a chemokine that's really critical to attract stem cells in the bone marrow and the fluctuations of the levels of, the, of CXCL12 uh, uh, allows the, the rhythm uh, e egress of, of stem cells from the bone marrow. And this is what really led us to uh, find out to, to try to learn more about what regulates the microenvironment of the bone marrow by tracking the nerve cells and seeing what the cells are targeted by these nerves. And most nerves are associated with blood vessels in the bone marrow or elsewhere. And we had found that in, in these animals um, uh, where GFP is marked by uh, nestin, uh, that the uh, perivascular cells and pericytes are marked and were closely associated with nerves. And it turns out that this is a very good marker to isolate mesenchymal stem cells in the bone marrow. And we found that, uh, that these cells were contributing to the niche in that they, were, they expressed very high levels of, of niche factors and um, they also are enriched in mesenchymal stem cell activity. We then developed methods to look at the, uh, in 3D, at the bone marrow architecture to try to uh, find uh, if we could predict where the niches are in the bone marrow by just looking at the, the relationship with structures, with nerves, and so forth. And it's been difficult, uh, and it's, it's hard to predict, but what we found is that if you look at nesting GFP, is that they were, um, uh, two major subsets of, of uh, GFP positive cells and you could find the bright cells that were wrapping arterioles in the bone marrow uh, and many were broadly distributed. We don't see it here because the, uh, you know, in imaging the bright signal uh, uh, comes out uh, and saturate the image. Uh, but we could see that there's a subset of stem cell that showed a significant association with these arterial vessels. And interestingly, if you uh, stimulate uh, a stem cell to proliferate, for example, by giving poly-IC, which is known to activate stem cells, we could see a redistribution of stem cells with uh, uh, those that were associated with the arterioles moving away from, from arterioles. By imaging, we found that there's another subset of stem cell that is significantly associated with megakaryocytes in, in the bone marrow. And the megakaryocytes also are important to control uh, the quiescence of stem cells. And so if you deplete megakaryocytes using, for example, uh, a CXCL4 or PF4 Cre uh, uh, cross with an inducible diphtherotoxin receptor, and give diphtheriotoxin to kill uh, the, the megakaryocytes in the bone marrow, what you see in response is the uh, fairly rapid proliferation of stem cells in the bone marrow. And that's shown here. And we found that, in fact, that the PF4 itself, uh, the chemokine, was important in, in regulating the quiescence of, of, uh, of stem cells in the bone marrow. Other groups, uh, Lin Hang Lee has found that TGF beta actually was, was playing a role in that regard. <laughs> so the, uh, Klaus Nerloff and, and Stan Eric Jacobson have uh, generated a mouse in which GFP is, is controlled by von Wilbrand factor uh, 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 re regulatory elements. And 
there is a fraction of long-term repopulating stem cells that is uh, VWF positive, uh, and they published that these cells are biased, or a subset of them are biased to uh, make uh, platelets. So they make only platelets, and they can actually self-renew and being transplanted and, and can do that really in, in the long term. Other cells that are VWF positive have multi-lineage uh, differentiation and can also self-renew. But we were intrigued and, and asked whether these, uh, this subset of stem cells that are von Wilbern factor positive might show a, a, a selective association with megakaryocytes because they were making platelets. And by imaging, if you look at VWF uh, positive and negative uh, stem cells, we found that that both subsets actually show an association with megakaryocytes in the bone marrow, uh, that's quite tight. But the VWF positive, it's even more uh, 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 closely associated. And by contrast, if you look at the relationship with uh, of uh, the two subsets of, of stem cells with arterioles, uh, we found that the VWF negative stem cells were those that were uh, that showed a significant relationship. Whereas the VWF positive uh, subset was basically very similar to a random uh, distribution in uh, the bone marrow. And, and the megakaryocyte appears also to regulate selectively uh, that subset of stem cells because if you repeat the same experiment that I showed you by, de the, by depleting megakaryocytes in the bone marrow, I showed you that stem cell uh, start proliferating, you can see that it, it is a subset that is VWF positive that uh, selectively proliferate in response of the loss of megakaryocyte. And so you have multiple cells in the bone marrow that are contributing, making a number of factors. Uh, and of course, uh, we uh, don't know or understand probably uh, the majority of them, uh, uh, but, and they are you know, sort of listed here. Uh, the most uh, studied are CXCL12, but also stem cell factor, which is largely derived from perivascular cells, but also uh, uh, endothelial cells are making it as well. And the gr group of Sean Morrison using uh, 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 TIE2 Crete to delete uh, stem cell factor in endothelial cells, in all endothelial cells, and leptin receptor Crete to delete it in perivascular cells found that that if you delete a stem cell factor in either cells, you have a significant reduction of uh, stem cells in, in the bone marrow. If you delete in both uh, cell compartments, you have a further reduction, which suggests that these, these two cells uh, uh, may collaborate. So we were uh, interested to uh, uh, understand or, or find out which uh, endothelial subset was actually contributing the most in uh, stem cell factor. And, and Chung Liang Shu in the lab, and this is published, I'll just show you a couple of slides uh, summarizing the data, uh, used uh, uh, markers. So SCA1 is a marker that's used fairly broadly to identify arterial endothelial cells in the bone marrow. It works well by imaging. But if you want to prospectively isolate endothelial cells, actually all the endothelial cells are, are expressing SCA1, so you need another marker. And he found that putoplanin is one marker that's helpful. And you can use also adhesion molecules that are uh, playing a role in homing, such as uh, uh, E-selectin or P-selectin along with SCA1 that also works uh, very well. So you can separate nicely arterial from uh, sinusoid endothelial cells. And if you look at these two niche factors, CXCL12 and stem cell factor, or KIT ligand, we could see surprisingly that they were segregated, that the KIT ligand or stem cell factor was made uh, uh, exclusively by the arterial endothelial cells. And that's confirmed if you look on the right here, where you see uh, reporter mice, uh, uh, SCFGFP, uh, and CXCL12 GFP mice, uh, with the SCF GFP, you can see that uh, the vast majority of uh, these endothelial cells are, are GFP positive, and by contrast, the sinusoid endothelial cells are um, uh, all negative for um, uh, GFP expression. 
for CXCL12, you, you find the same uh, uh, kind of pattern, but it's not as dramatic. But those, the, endothelial, the arterial endothelial cells uh, uh, appear to express a higher level. They have the CAR CXCL12 abundant definition. They are GFP bright. Uh, and But you do find in the sinusoid some uh, GFP expression that it's more intermediate. So we wanted to delete stem cell factor selectively in these endothelial cells, and we found that, well, BMX uh, uh, is a, a, a factor that was previously shown to be uh, enriched in arterioles, and you can see in the bone marrow that it seems to uh, work as well. And we found that uh, EPO receptor actually was expressed at high levels in sinusoid endothelial cells, and it also it seemed to be expressed uh, selectively. So we used these uh, Cree lines to delete, and we found that if you delete uh, uh, SCF with EPOR uh, Cree mice, we basically don't find a phenotype in the stem cell numbers by competitive reconstitution, whereas by contrast, if you delete SCF uh, in the arterial uh, uh, side, we find the phenotypes uh, confirming that, that the uh, um, arterial endothelial cells are making a significant amount of, of uh, SCF in the bone marrow. So we've recently also studied uh, the effect of aging on the microenvironment, and also this was also recently published. I'll just show you a couple of uh, highlights on, on, on these data. And as the, uh, during aging of the bone marrow, you can see uh, pretty dramatic changes, particularly of the vasculature, as you see, while well, the bone is bigger for one thing. But also, if you look at these uh, long uh, arteries that you see in young mice, you can see much shorter uh, arterial structures in um, aged mice. And that's quantified here, where you have a, a marked reduction of, of the arterial segment, and also, as uh, consistent with data from, uh, uh, from uh, Adams, uh, who has shown that uh, alpha smooth muscle actin uh, positive cells in the bone marrow are decreased during aging, you have a profound loss of, of these, of these uh, cells in the bone marrow. And uh, by contrast, you see an expansion of these nesting uh, GFP bright uh, cells in the bone marrow and expansion also of MSCs in the bone marrow uh, uh, as well. What was remarkable, we're coming back to uh, innervation and the role of nerves, is that if you quantify innervation and sympathetic nerves by staining with uh, tyrosine hydroxylase, you can see a significant reduction in, in these Th positive nerve fibers in, uh, uh, in the bone marrow, but also even if you measure per arterial, you have a significant reduction. And that's confirmed with uh, other markers. If you use a pan-neuronal marker like beta-3 tubulin, you find a similar kind of result with a reduction of the staining in the bone marrow. And uh, if you stain for uh, synapse uh, uh, by synaptophysin, you find as well a significant reduction of that uh, uh, signal in the bone marrow. So this is consistent with a loss of, of uh, innervation uh, um, in the bone marrow. It starts early. We, we did, can detect it as early as eight months of age, and it, it progressively gets, uh, gets worse. Um, the the uh, one of the uh, uh, functional uh, consequence of this is, uh, as I showed you with the first slide, you have circadian oscillation of, uh, uh, of progenitor cells in blood. In young mice, uh, you, you have a peak during the daytime and a trough at, at night, and, but you can see in the old animals that these oscillations are blunted. In young mice, you see uh, oscillations of CXTL12 that attracts and, main, uh, and keeps uh, stem and progenitor cells in bone marrow, and that uh, fluctuates uh, inversely compared to the progenitors. So when you have CXTL12, you retain in the bone marrow. Uh, you have nice oscillations in young mice. This is also loss in, in the uh, uh, old animals. And we did an experiment at, uh, to look at this uh, more functionally, and, and where we denervated uh, uh, the bone marrow of young mice on one side, 
and left the other bone intact. So we could assess what is the impact of the loss of innervation on uh, uh, locally in one bone in this, uh, compared to this, the other bone in the same mouse. And so then we allowed the mouse to you know, live for four more months. And if you then uh, look at the impact in, in stem cell numbers, you could see uh, a picture that really resemble what we see in, in natural aging. You have an increased number of uh, phenotypic stem cells. If you isolate these stem cells, do competitive reconstitution, you find that they don't function as well. So you have a, a, a defect in reconstitution of these stem cells. If you look in the bone marrow environment, microenvironment, you in fact also see similar changes with uh, changes of the uh, vascular structures, loss of uh, or reduction of arterial segments that are very similar to natural aging. And if you isolate uh, MSCs in the bone marrow, you find that they are increased in number as you see with natural aging. And I didn't show you the data, but with natural aging, they don't function as well as, as in young uh, um, MSCs, and you find similar changes in denervated bone marrow with a reduced CFUF formation and a reduction of niche factor uh, uh, synthesis. So this suggests that the, if you uh, remove the innervation in young mice, you have a premature aging phenotype. And so then we did the experiment of, of adding back uh, uh, adrenergic or, ca or catecholamines in mice, can we uh, uh, rescue or rejuvenate uh, the old mice? So we took uh, two-year-old animals and then uh, uh, implanted pumps in which we would give beta-2 or beta-3 uh, agonists in these mice and then looked at the impact on stem cells and also on the microenvironment. And in all the old stem cells don't work as well compared to young, as, as shown here. If you give a beta-2 agonist in, in green, uh, we find that there's not that much difference, not that much uh, uh, rescue. But the beta-3 uh, uh, agonist administration significantly improved the ability of these stem cells to compete uh, by after transplantation. And that was kept in, uh, even in secondary transplantation where we would see a significant improvement in uh, repopulation, even particularly of the lymphoid um, compartment, which is reduced in, in, uh, in aged uh, mice. So if you, look, if you do RNA-seq on these stem cells to see whether indeed they look rejuvenated in terms of their uh, transcriptome profile, you can see that there's a, a, a difference between a young and old, and the uh, uh, rejuvenated uh, s seem to look uh, uh, more similar to the young than, than the old. But of, of course, there are genes that are not uh, completely uh, uh, rejuvenated. But if you look at the pathways, we see in the downregulated genes a lot of uh, influence on cell cycle. Uh, suggesting that uh, this rejuvenation process may have uh, uh, induced uh, or re uh, restored a quiescent state uh, of, of the stem cells. Whereas the top uh, 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 upregulated genes, uh, as you see, involved uh, uh, a lot of uh, metabolic pathways, and, and, and we still don't understand exactly what's going on in the rejuvenation process, but it's something we're interested to investigate. So the, for this first part, the, uh, um, so the arterioles and megakaryocytes confer specific microenvironments that regulate the, the functionality uh, of distinct subset of stem cells. The endothelial cell-derived uh, stem cell factor is uh, uh, produced uh, exclusively by the arterial uh, tree. Uh, of uh, the endothelial, uh, I'm talking about the endothelial contribution. And during aging, you lose these uh, um, arterioles uh, and uh, you find that you, 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 ha you have a loss of beta-3 uh, signals in the niche and the supplementation of beta-3 signals may be uh, uh, an interesting way to study further to uh, rejuvenate uh, the uh, hematopoiesis of the bone marrow. So now, one other aspect, and I'll uh, 
is that we've done uh, or tried to do recently uh, was to study the, the uh, stromal cells and, and with a frustrating project where if you culture the stromal cells in vitro, you have major changes in their function. And, and if you look at the niche cell in vivo, they express a lot, uh, very high levels of niche factors, stem cell factors, CXCL12, angioportin 1, BCAM1, very high. But when you culture them, you can see very rapid uh, or, and very profound downregulation in the expression of these uh, uh, niche factors by the cell. So that's maybe one of the reason why it's so difficult to expand stem cells in vitro, uh, which has been a major uh, uh, problem in the field. And so if you look at the, uh, so we thought that maybe there is some uh, uh, major changes in the wiring of these stromal cells and the transcriptional uh, network of these uh, cells. And so if you look at the transcriptional uh, uh, fa uh, transcription factors that are expressed at high levels in the stromal cells. Uh, we've made a list of about 40 that's shown here. And then we looked at the profile where uh, these uh, transcription factors were selectively expressed by the nestin GFP positive cells uh, compared to nestin uh, GFP negative cells and were also in culture downregulated. And you have uh, the same kind of pattern that's confirmed by PCR for all these factors. Whereas others didn't meet these criteria, either because they were not specifically expressed or because uh, they were not downregulated in culture. But we have 28 factors that we started to work on that we could uh, manage. Um, and so what we did is to take uh, the SCFGFP uh, mouse uh, which you can see GFP expression in these uh, uh, niche cells. If you culture them uh, for three weeks in vitro, you can see the loss of GFP expression, which is consistent with what we see with the endogenous genes. And then we did the Yamanaka-like experiment by putting back these factors into uh, stromal cells. Not that we want to reprogram or, or, or change the fate of these cells, but we want to uh, reprogram in terms of uh, rev revitalizing uh, their function. And indeed, if you look five days later, we could see the reappearance of some uh, GFP uh, positive uh, cells in, in the culture. So we then made single cell clones and, and, uh, of, of these, and here you have a list of, of 16 clones that uh, we've been able to analyze and sequence. And you can see that all the 28 uh, genes integrated uh, uh, well, but you see the, the pattern where some of the genes come back more often. In particular, these four genes, um, uh, IRF7, uh, XBP1, IRF3, and uh, OSTF1 uh, are present in more than 75% uh, of uh, the cases. Um, if you look at these clones uh, for expression of niche factors, they were selected for SCF expression, so all of them show increased SCF expression. But it's interesting to see that, that you know, we often see that these factors are regulated together, they're downregulated together. When you mobilize, they're downregulated together. So, we, but if you look at these clones, they're, they're not uh, uh, expressed in, in um, uh, together, you can see differences. For example, this clone has very high expression of SCF, but very low expression of the other three uh, niche genes. And so if you take the same clones and do co-culture with stem cells, we found that the clone C5 was particularly uh, uh, good at, uh, at expanding stem cells compared to the others. And that C5 clone had uh, integrated all four genes that came up uh, more often, but also a fifth uh, gene, KLF7, was, was present. And so, uh, and this is how the cells uh, look. Uh, they, uh, Fumio uh, was impressed that they, may, they make a very bright smile at you, so they, they look uh, very happy, and he called them those that integrated five genes, cozy, uh, 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 and uh, 
those that they integrated four genes uh, are OZ. Uh, and so we looked uh, with independent, so this is reproducible. He's done it with uh, uh, several times and compared four genes with five genes to see what, what is the contribution of the fifth gene. And we find the fifth gene seems to be doing something. Uh, but you see here uh, the gene factor expression is higher uh, in the presence of the fifth gene. And also, the, uh, if you co-culture with stem cells, you have a further expansion of uh, phenotypic stem cells with five genes compared to the four genes. Uh, we did the N minus one experiment by removing each of the four genes, and you can see that if you look at the uh, reappearance of GFP uh, positive cells, that each of the four genes are important for that effect to occur. Uh, whereas the fifth gene, uh, if you add it uh, over uh, on, on top of the four genes, we don't find any significant improvement or addi uh, addition in the number of GFP cells that are present. But we do find all these important uh, functional improvements, so we've kept uh, the, fi the fifth gene for our further analysis. And so we call these the revitalized cells. So what, are, what happens to these mesenchymal stem cells uh, uh, when they are revitalized? Well, you, you, if you look at expression of, uh, of surface markers that mark for MSC, you find that they express higher levels of these MSC markers. And also, if you do functional assay for MSC, that they, they form more spheres and they form also bigger spheres in, in vitro. So it seems to improve their ability to be cultured and to form the spheres. They don't lose their ability to differentiate. You can see adipogenic, osteogenic, and chondrogenic differentiation in, in, by these cells although maybe the, the, the bone uh, differentiation may be a little bit uh, uh, reduced compared to, uh, to control. So the idea here was to, we thought we were gonna generate a cell that will make all the goodies, all the good factors, so that we don't need to add exogenous cytokines, which would be better, because I always thought that adding a lot of, we don't know if we're adding the right amount of cytokines. It's not regulated, it may not be so good for stem cells. So the only cytokine that we add here is TPO, which uh, comes from outside of the bone marrow. Uh, well, it's still controversial, but presumably the most of it does. Um, and so, but it, 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 it looks like, so we've compared without stem cell factor and with stem cell factors. It looks like adding a little bit of stem cell factor expands stem cells better, so they probably don't make just quite enough or present it in the way that's needed to have optimal expansion. But certainly, there's always, it's always better than, uh, than control uh, uh, stromal cells, particularly if you look at functional assay. If you do transplantation, uh, comparing control uh, MSCs with revitalized MSCs, there's a huge difference with the uh, uh, much better reconstitution with uh, revitalized MSCs. And again, with secondary transplantation, you see that it is, it is sustained. So if you look at uh, radio protection, so the ability of protecting a mouse that's lethally radiated by, uh, uh, by, with radiation. So if you give uh, very f small numbers of bone marrow cells unfractionated, uh, the mice die. If you uh, give the same number of cells uh, that were revitalized, you have uh, more protection. And here's the data with the limiting dilution with transplantation of mice. Uh, uh, to quantify the level of expansion, you increase by about sevenfold the number of stem cells in, in the culture. Another experiment that was surprising is if you look at the stem cells, when they, they are cultured, they, they, they have uh, signs of DNA damage or, or replication stress by gamma H2AX foci that can be detected. You can see that stem cells that are cultured with uh, uh, revitalized MSCs some, somehow they are, they have less uh, uh, foci, less of this uh, DNA damage compared to uh, control stromal cells. The other feature is that the, uh, these, this is mouse stromal cells. Even if it's mouse, they're actually very good to expand human uh, 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 core blood derived uh, 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 stem cells, as you see here with this graph. 
and that's also functional if you do uh, transplantation in mice you have uh, a significant increase in the engraftment uh, of, of the, uh, the stromal cells of the uh, stem cells human stem cells so this is the analysis of looking or looked at the try to understand the mechanism uh, these are uh, niche factors that, or factors that have been shown to be associated with niche, comparing revitalized with the endogenous uh, or uh, native niche cells, so SCFGFP positive. The, you can see that they uh, are looking more similar to the uh, um, native in vivo niche cells. So we expected when we did uh, 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 principal component analysis that they would come closer uh, to the... Uh, in vivo cells, but you can see that all these, uh, uh, so in vivo cells or culture cells, uh, they all have different spots. So they go to a different uh, area of the sphere. I don't, I don't see quite well which, which one it is here, but the, uh, uh, yeah, the red one is the revitalized. Uh, and so it's a different uh, space. Uh, so probably there's still a big imprint of the culture conditions, and that's why we see such uh, a result. But if you compare the genes that are upregulated in revitalized stromal cells compared to the uh, native uh, niche cells and, and what is in common, these are the pathways that, that come up with uh, uh, RAP1 signaling, axon guidance, PDGF beta, and, and so forth. We did a taxi to look at open chromatin to see what's common between the native niche cells and the re revitalized cells. And what's interesting, and if you look at the, what's common, it's very similar to what we have detected by um, RNA-seq, and the same pathways uh, come up. And when we did motif analysis, we, uh, there's one transcription factor, MEF2C, that came up really at the top uh, and, uh, of this analysis. So we thought that this might be interesting. And if you look at the expression of MEF2C, actually this is one uh, transcription factor that appears to be selectively expressed by um, uh, SCF GFP positive cells in vivo. It's downregulated in culture and it's uh, reinduced in revitalized uh, stem cells. So it should have been detected in our, it met our criteria. We, we did not pick that factor initially, probably because the level of expression was not uh, did not meet the threshold that we had uh, set. But it is a factor that is expressed and it is uh, confirmed here by PCR, re-expressed in revitalized uh, uh, stem cells. So MEF2C, uh, maybe some of you know, I, well, I didn't know much about this factor. It's been uh, identified uh, as its role for muscle differentiation. Other roles have been uh, found in for neural crest development, uh, B cell function, and also bone development, which is relevant to uh, this project, with uh, studies uh, done uh, by Eric Olson's lab showing during development uh, uh, some function. And, and MEF2C, uh, so we've looked at the function uh, of MEF2C uh, with knockdown and to see if it affects the revitalized uh, cell function. And you can see a, a significant, but not too uh, not huge reduction of niche factor expression if you knock down MEF2C, but more uh, impressively is the expansion of revitalized uh, uh, MSCs is, is significantly reduced if you knock down MEF2C. So it seems to be an important uh, factor downstream of the uh, uh, factors that we've used to revitalize. So in summary here, uh, we have five factors here that uh, appear to be uh, uh, able to revitalize MSCs, increasing their niche capacity, and these can expand both mouse and human uh, stem cells. The, so we think that this might be an important or provide a plat platform to try to identify uh, novel uh, uh, factors that are important for stem cell maintenance or specification. And as I just show you, we think MEF2C it appears to be a, an important uh, downstream uh, factor that, uh, that plays a role in, in the process. So I want to thank uh, the people that have done the work that I showed you, uh, Fumio 
Actually, I should maybe move him to the column of former member. He's back in Japan, uh, has done the revitalization work. Danielle Borger is, has continued or is continuing the project, a new student in the lab. And Maria Marianovich did the aging studies, Chung Liang the endothelial studies, and Sandra, the, the work on, on, uh, on uh, megakaryocyte that I showed you. So our collaborators, funding, and thank you very much. That's, that's a good question. I, you know, I, I, I would expect, I would expect so. I think, uh, you know, there was, I think some people are studying this actually. There's some uh, uh, student I met uh, at some Keystone conference who, who's getting data about this. And I don't, I haven't met him recently, so I don't know the latest of this, but he had some, some changes that were, Certainly there were hematopoietic abnormalities, whether it's aging, premature aging. This was a long time ago. It remains to be seen. I, I'm not aware of data about this, but uh, it would be interesting to see. And, and beta-3 would be interesting to, to see whether it would uh, have beneficial effects if, if uh, you know, that's the, that's the thing is what in, in people, uh, whether the aging process Will will lead to could maybe there's more leukemia that remains to be seen. Certainly, the immune dysfunction could be a stem cell disease. It's it's clear it clearly is in the mouse. Whether it is in human, I think the data is not so. So, but it's certainly worth looking at that. It it could be it's a possibility. Uh, <clears throat> did did you look to see if the denervation in the mouse models affected the circulating? the circadian oscillation of, that you'd also seen, are those two related? Yeah, uh, we didn't. And the reason we didn't is probably we didn't expect because we denervate only one femur or maybe also the tibia. That probably amounts to probably 12% maximum of the total bone marrow. So you have a lot of bone marrow that remains innervated in the body. So if you look at the oscillations in the blood, you probably will not detect, you, you don't expect to detect much change uh, in that experiment. Mm -hmm. Maybe with the drug. With the drug, yes, and that we've done. 